Well, there's good news and there's bad news whenever you record these kind of screencasts. The bad news is I've just recorded the entire thing. And then when I clicked playback, I realized that my microphone wasn't turned on. <laughs> but the good news is I've got the entire text for this example lesson already in my copy paste buffer and I'm going to paste it in and we're just going to talk through it. Essentially what I've had this idea of doing is putting one more lesson on the Hello World series and this time I'm going to take it from being a very basic RPG program that just does Hello World to the screen to use a kind of an RPG template that I prefer to use. So for example, I don't like to use the full logic cycle in my programs if they're written in modern RPG. So I will use a procedure that I call mainline. You could call yours whatever you like. And I say, by default, go and do the mainline program. I believe the programs run slightly faster because they're not having any of that logic cycle guff added into the logic of things they have to do. Um, I also do pretty standard coding where I have three parameters that I check. Why am I talking about this now? Why don't we get pasting and talk you through the code in real time while we do it? So just to refresh your memory from the previous lesson, we were looking at some source code. So if I say work member PDM in my library, and I'm going to look at QRPG LE source. I'm going to look at all the hello programs that I created. We've got um, six Hello programs. You can see that I'm also running Visual Studio Code. I've already connected, and I can see that I've got six Hello programs there. Let's create another one, shall we? Let's create one. I could equally do this in VS Code, but here we go. And let's call it Hello7. We'll make it an RPG LE. And this one will be um, uh, uh, sample Hello World program with extra um, gubbins. That's exactly what it's going to have in there, some extra gubbins. I'm going to leave it completely empty in SEU because we're going to paste it in to uh, the um, Visual Studio Code. Oh, lost the ability to speak for a second. So here's my empty source member. So let's go and refresh QRPGLE source. Ba -ba -ba. There's my hello world. Let's open it in the Visual Studio Code editor. And let's paste this in using a cunning paste as if I'm typing it tool, which basically just pastes this in slower so I can talk you through it while it's coming. Okay, so this is a, com a complex but stylish hello world. Again, this is aimed for complete new guys, uh, not for established programmers. If you are an established programmer, welcome. Please be gentle in your comments. I'm sure there's lots of typos in my code because um, I like to deliberately misspell things just to keep you on your toes. Here's my standard program header. I use um, line three, which is a big overview of what this code does. Then I normally enter a couple of paragraphs just talking about how this program works and what it's up to. In this case, I've written a bit more comments than I would usually do because I want to explain some of the more complex setup attributes of this RPG program that complete noob programmers, freshers, wouldn't necessarily understand. The first one that I'm going through here is the main mainline. I create a procedure called mainline. You can call it whatever you like. And I tell the control option in the program to go and do that by default. So as opposed to the old logic cycle, running all of its stuff and going and running, running through its mainline code, any of the code that I write almost always has just procedures. And if you want to jump to the main one, you just search for mainline in the code and it takes you straight to that procedure. The PCML and module attributes um, are there because they embed information about the parameters into the program used notably by um, the integrated web server doesn't make any change to how your program runs. It just has some extra information embedded into it. Talking about embedding information, let me pause this just after the control options. You'll notice that one of the control options I type in is this one, copyright. Typically, I think IBM um, added that to give developers the right to say copyright, you know, Nick Litton Software Incorporated, the company name embedded in their code. Um, I use it because I find it much more useful to put in a version number and the name of the code. 
Um, you can see in this example, that because I've already recorded this video once already, when I first typed this whole piece of code in and compiled it, it worked lovely. And then when I ran it a second time, I wanted to add a piece of code so that if it failed, it would send a message to the screen. So I came in here and added the version one added error. Then I updated the version number in my copyright so that when I do a display program from the screen, I can see embedded in the object the exact version of the code that that was compiled from. This is especially useful, this technique, if you've got multiple environments. Sometimes the source will get disconnected from the compiled object. You're not too sure if it's the right version. Looking in the source here, I can say this source is version one. If I do a dis display program, I can see that it matches or not. Okay. Um, my parameters that are coming in are three parameters, an environment code, which is a three character code. It's just a standard that I like to use. Most of the time I'm using a develop a test, a UAT, user acceptance testing or QA, and a production environment. I like to send that into the code and maybe set the library list depending on that, whatever. And then I return back to the caller a success indicator that either says everything was great, it's an indicator, it's a Boolean value on or off. Everything was great or I failed or there was some error condition. Then optionally I return a message text string straight after that to say what went wrong or sometimes it worked and here's some extra information about what I did. Um, right, let's, let's carry on to the exciting stuff which is the main body of the code itself. So once we've defined our control option we're now just going to go straight into defining our first procedure, right? This is the mainline one that we've said this is what you're going to run by default. I say it's a program interface here is my three parameters that are coming in, environment, character three, success indicator, and that text I was talking about. I then declare a variable called my response, and we'll get to that in a minute. The first thing I do is valid underscore environment. I check that my environment code is valid, and I'm gonna do that in a second sub procedure, which we'll see in just a few lines of code. If it is a valid environment code coming in, it matches my preferred selection, I'm then just gonna say, let's stick a message to the screen, the environment code. Then I've got this little do loop. Um, if you're a complete new person to RPG world or the IBMI world, you might not be aware of the differences between a do loop, a do until loop, or a do while loop. A do loop says, you could say, do 15 times. So it'll do that piece of code 15 times. A do while loop, you could say do while a variable has this value. Do while uh, username equals Nick. So when it's reading through, reading a file that has usernames on there, it would only process for the Nick ones. The difference with do until is do until says always do this loop at least once regardless of the logic. So go in and check it at the end. Do until it changes. So a do while loop will never go in if that value isn't satisfied. A do until will always go in. Or another way to look at it is do while checks the logic at the top and do until checks the logic at the bottom. So what we're saying here is stick the message onto the screen. Then we're saying press yes to continue. Do until the response that comes back always in uppercase is equal to Y. And then the display message is slightly different to what you've been used to in previous examples. I'm displaying this variable, press yes to continue, and I'm sending in two extra fields. This second field says expect a response. I'm just sending a blank because all I care about is what the response is that's coming back. So I'm saying stick it to the screen, expect a response, and put the response into this field. And then when I check the field, I say whatever they typed on the screen, always treat it as uppercase. And if it's a yes, we're gonna leave the loop. So do until they enter a Y. So if they enter an N, anything else, it'll just keep staying on the screen, staying on the screen, staying on the screen. And if they enter an uppercase Y or a lowercase Y, because we're saying always treat it as upper, it will drop out the loop, turn success on, and the program will end. If the uh, valid environment failed, then we're gonna turn success off. We're gonna put a message saying environment code was bad, and we're just gonna display that to the job log. 
let's have a quick look at this valid environment. If valid environment, here it is. Really simple code example, where literally I'm saying, here's my procedure name. I want you to pass in um, the environment code and I want you to return to me an on or an off indicator. I'll explain this in a second. The main body of this code just says, have a look at that environment came in. If it's equal to dev, test, UAT or prod, then return an on, that's this indicator value. Otherwise return an off. So what this means is when I run this sub procedure, it will, it will always return, I nearly belched into the microphone then, shocking behavior. It will return a boolean on or an off the nice thing about that is in my code up here this entire value valid environment will be treated as an on or an off because it knows that's what i'm returning so that's why i can say if valid environment which basically is saying equal on okay if that returns an on do this otherwise do this we don't need to say if equals to on because that's assumed when you look at a variable the same way that if I was looking at um, the success field I could say if success and what that implies is it says if success equals on or I could say if not success that would says if success equals off it's the same piece of code so there's our code so let's go and compile it now I could two ways of compiling it you'll remember it let me save this first of all so when I save hello7, it's been saved, and go back to green screen. Let's do this in the green screen world so you can see in all its ugly green glory. If I look in that hello7 uh, source member, here's our source member in SEU. Okay, this is what we've just typed in. Let's compile this, shall we? So within SEU, we do a 14 to compile. We make sure it's going to the right library and lit in which it is. We press enter. Um, of course, it says it already exists because I've already recorded this video before. We're going to press yes to delete it and update it. It submits a job to batch. I have to do a work submitted jobs. Page down the bottom. There she blows the last one on the list. I can do an eight to look at the spool files. I can do a five to look at the compile listing. Um, and here's my compile listing. I now want to go to the bottom of the compile listing to see what happened with the compiled. I can either page all the way down or I can just type a B for bottom into the control field. Takes me to the bottom where it tells me the program was placed in library and litten. Good stuff, right? So I'm not gonna call it, let's just display that program first. Display program in litten, hello seven. Here's my program. It tells me all the attributes of what this thing's doing. Now if I press hello a few times to get through to the copyright screen, I think it's here, here we go. Here is the copyright statement that we entered in our Visual Studio Code source. Hello, this is modification one and uh, my code. I know it's stylized with an S. That's the English way of spelling it, not the American. So let's make a little change to this, shall we? How about we whip back into our code, back in uh, Visual Studio. Let's, uh, what should we do? What should we do to make this different? Okay, let's just make something really simple. Let's just say environment code is p underscore environment. So I would add a new comment to the top in Visual Studio Code, neat little shortcut, uh, shift, alt, down on whatever line you're on, it replicates it. So I could now say version two, uh, I might say uh, minor change to success environment code text or something like that right i make sure to update my copyright statement so that i know this version of the code if you can hear a very loud rumbling i think the one with the harley davidson is just fired up on the street outside the house don't think that i'm passing wind it's unrelated um so here's version two we put it in the code let's save it and compile we just saw all the fuss of compiling using PDM and work submitted jobs. I could do it interactively, but it's all kerfuffle, right? Let's do it in VS Code and see how much simpler it is. If we whip back into VS Code, right click on our source member and say run action. My action is create bound RPG. I'm gonna click it. It submits a job, it runs, it shows me the result. Here we are, hello successful. 
it shows me the spool file in VS Code and tells me that it's created. Lovely, right? Which version do you prefer to do? The free VS Code version or the clunky old SEU? You can't deny that was better, that's just slick. Either way, it's now created that code. Let's do an F9 to pull back our display program message and go and have a look at that program and see what we've got. It all looks the same. It has indeed got the correct compile time. If I press enter a few times to jump down to the copyright statement, look, we can see it's version two, which is the correct version. So how about we call it? You'll notice in the code, uh, up in my comment, <clears throat> excuse me, in my comment section, I have a sample call statement. Let's do both. Let's call it with the correct version on there. I'm gonna press F10 to display all my log messages. So if I just call hello seven, passing in dev, a blank and a blank, because you have to match the number of parameters. Oh, it couldn't find it. Oh, it's not in my library list. I have to qualify the library that it's in. So I'm gonna put in Edlitten, it's not in my library list. If I press enter, here we are. So it's displayed the environment code to the job log, and now it, we're within that do until loop that's looping around. It's waiting for this response to come back. This reply that's going to come back is the my response field. Is the uh, my response field. We're in this loop here, waiting for a Y. If I put in something else, how about I put in, I don't know, a J? It says, nope, do until. I'll put in a K. Nope, do until. How about putting a Y, lowercase? The percent upper will treat it as an uppercase. The program ends. Beautiful, did exactly what we wanted to do. How about we call it and we deliberately set it the wrong parameter? So I'm gonna type in uh, wrong, W-R-O. <laughs> and press enter. Oh, let me show you one other little trick here that few people know. If I prompt this command up, here's my prompted command. You notice there were multiple screens with the parameters I can page down and go through these screens especially when you're doing something like a restore object or save library or whatever. You can have screens and screens and screens of information. If you wanna copy all of those screens into an email or to a log, a memory jogger for yourself, a neat way of doing it is press Shift F2. That's function key 14. It takes the entire parameter list of the command and shows you in nicely formatted. If there was lots and lots of screens here, this might go all the way down here. It's just a really useful trick that I use for copying and pasting commands into text documents. So we can see here, this is what it's about to run. Uh, the parameter list now says WRO. So we're expecting to see an error message, right? So let me press enter to go back to the main screen and press enter to run it. And here we are, it's called the code, didn't even get passed. It came in, it ran the valid environment check WRO was not meeting any of these values, so it returned an off. If that is on, that failed because it returned an off, so it went down to the else statement, and it then did this. It turned success off, set up the field for message in valid environment code, and stuck it out to the job log. And that's exactly what we saw here. And that's it. That's Hello World, just fleshed out a little bit made a bit more fancy. Um, I hope that made sense if you're a complete fresher and I hope my neighbours Harley Davidson wasn't too much of a distraction. Hasta luego. <laughs>